it's nice to see you all here this morning. There's some familiar faces, but some new faces. So um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Cathy Debrew, and I work on the OBI programs, different ones that I do teach UE sometimes, um, but I don't know all your faces. So hello and welcome. Today I'm going to talk to you about climate change, and I've given my talk this title, Science, the Silence and the Solutions. And I hope what I'm going to be able to persuade you this morning is that climate change is something that is really real, it's really happening, and we can do a lot about it. There's a lot we can do to make, um, to, to make the, the, the planet a better place going forward. So let me start by giving you a very brief overview of um, the talk. I'm going to look at global warming and the causes of climate change and maybe try and talk a little about the differences between global warming and climate change. Then we're going to look at some of the key effects, so what that results in. I'll move on then to looking at what we're going to, what we are doing about it. So what are governments, what are countries, what are people doing about um, climate change? And then having a look at some of the problems involved in getting people to do things about it. So there's problems, there's psychological problems, but there's also economical problems, um, economic problems rather, that can be different. Um, last of all, I'm going to look at how you can make a difference and why it's really important for you to um, see what you can do about it. So if I start with uh, this rather alarming title, 250, 2015 was the warmest year on record. So we've warmed 1.5 degrees since pre-industrial times. That means over 200 years ago when we started um, using fossil fuels and uh, coal and gas to make our industries bigger when we were learning how to use, uh, uh, creating trains and an industrial world. We've moved very, very quickly from that time how much fossil fuel that we burn to now. And this heating up is now considered to be due to human influence on the climate system. So this quote from um, a report done by over uh, 890 scientists from different governments all over the world in different disciplines, they've come up with this um, this quote I'll quickly read you. Human influence on the climate system is clear, and recent anthropo anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are the highest in history. Recent climate changes have had widespread impacts on human and natural systems. So, uh, anthropogenic was one of the words that I asked you to look at for your homework. It just means done by humans, induced by humans, our actions, okay? So I'm going to take you back to what might be school science for some of you, but it's the, the basis of what global warming is, so it's important to briefly look at it. We're going to look at the greenhouse effect, which is about how the sun warms our planet, and some of that warmth is reflected back into the atmosphere, some of it warms the earth, but other parts of it, hold it, other parts of it are trapped in this halo around the earth, with, because of the CO2 and gases that we're burning. So we burn these fossil fuels. Here are the four different kinds of fossil fuels that are mostly in the atmosphere. And they work rather like a blanket, a bit like a blanket around the earth, trapping those dirty um, emissions that we uh, keep emitting. So what's changed? Well. We now consume many, many more fossil fuels than ever before, so coal and gas and oil. The population growth has, uh, is, is six times larger than it was in pre-industrial times, we need seven times larger than it was in pre-industrial times. So everything from our food production, our agriculture, mining, and the way we behave puts this uh, CO2 into the air. So, behaviours, when I say consumerist lifestyle behaviours, I mean how we behave, how we buy things, how we use things. So, I had the example of um, 
a picture of my grandmother knitting her sock. So the hole in a sock, and she would knit it up. So now you probably go to Primark and buy six for £2.50. So nobody's knitting up their socks metaphorically. And therefore, the, the waste we produce is really considerable. We all need more meat, much, much more meat. And the energy pr produced to make meat is much more than the energy needed to produce grain. So, again, these behaviours are <coughs> pushing up the levels of CO2 and emissions that we're giving. Our travel and tourism. I wonder how many of you have been to far-flung places in the globe. We take cheap flights regularly, easy jet and so forth. Um, these travel and tourism habits also push up the emissions. So the miserable prediction is that if we keep going, then our planet is going to uh, creep up, or creep up, shoot up three degrees per century. So that may not sound like much, but I'm going to try and explain to you what that means um, throughout the course of this lecture. So let's have a look at some of the dirty fossil fuels and where they come from. Um, here we're going to look at, um, we've got coal pits here from a steel plant in China. This is in the Hebei region, which has seven of the most polluted um, cities in, in, that, uh, in that country. I don't know if anyone here recognises this picture, but here it is belching out fumes. Another picture is of fracking wells uh, in Pennsylvania. Fracking is a system where... They drill to the bottom of the earth very deep and they push chemicals and sand and water at very high speeds and they push gas out. So this is a gas extracting method. If I try and show you this here, this is a car. So it gives you an idea of the scale of um, the fracking industry in that one part of the world. It gets a little bit more positive later on, so bear with me. This is tar sands in Alberta, Canada. Tar sands are a different kind of fossil fuel. It's a sand with lots of oil in it. It's very sticky, it's very dirty, and it's very difficult to get the tar out of, um, out of the sands here. It involves a lot of um, carving up of the earth. If you have a look at this picture here, again, for scale, here's a, here's a truck here in the middle, and this is just a scale of, um, gives you an idea of what they're doing. This used to be a very, very green part of Canada, right in the middle, absolutely beautiful environmental um, haven, and this is what we're looking at now. So. Um, <laughs> These uh, examples then of coal and gas and um, bitumen is the name of the, the fuel that they're extracting here. I've given you a slightly uh, more pleasant looking picture to paint the next scenario, which is what's the result of all of those fossil fuels being burned? Well, if we have a look here on this um, little uh, picture, you can see that um, the key things are in the middle. You've got higher temperatures and more heat waves. Think about your countries, do you think that sounds true to you? Have you noticed higher temperatures, heat waves? More droughts and wildfires. Well, I don't know how long you've been on the UE programme, but the droughts <coughs> in and around England have been really big news this year um, and increasingly <coughs> severe. We've also got things like stronger storms and changing snow and rain patterns. This affects animals and habitats and the life cycles of plants. So, um, if you have a look then at all of these um, effects, you'll see that along with uh, along with other things, we could summarise them as these points here. So, extreme weather events, floods, drought. Um, heat waves, sea level rises. This is where um, the levels of the sea are rising due to the fact that the ocean is warming and the ice caps are melting and more water is going into the sea. So if you're living in a low island state, um, like Tuvalu, some of the Pacific islands, it's a real problem because your living space is being uh, 
uh, literally eroded. The obvious things that you probably know about or are familiar with are air, water and land pollution and the ocean getting more acidic. What does that mean, the ocean getting more acidic? Well, if you change the balance of the ocean, then many of the smaller creatures um, change their shells or change their makeup. So you're altering the food chain all the way along for the different creatures and animals that live in the sea. Scarcity of resources, so water and food and water at the security of those resources is being threatened. In the very worst case scenarios, these can lead to famine, climate migration where people have to move because there's no food there or there's no water there or their land is no longer there. And um, at the very worst, conflict as well when people will start to compete uh, for resources. Species and biodiversity, I, I promised myself I would not show you pictures of polar bears on ice caps or beautiful tigers because I think this is an image you're all familiar with, but this is something very real. If we continue as we're going, then we're projected to lose about 30% of our species by the end of this century. So that's quite worrying. Um, but, there, I put a list of some of the extreme weather events that you can see here. But the key thing to look at is what kind of events they are. Heat waves, cyclones, floods, and also the amount of damage that they do to people, not to mention the costs for countries to mitigate or to help in those events. So the next key thing, apart from the planet, is global health. So all of these things have a big effect on our health in different countries and different places. So inefficient and polluting energy, these dirty gases that we're talking about, from transport systems and our behavior, directly harm our health. So they affect breathing, asthma rates, and the ability for people in poorer countries um, to manage uh, the difficulty, sorry, with managing health for people in poorer countries becomes increasingly more and more difficult. So air pollution, the statistic that I've got here um, from the World Health Organization is that there are seven million deaths each year, or one in eight of all deaths globally is linked to air pollution. So you may have seen pictures of, uh, say for example, people wearing masks in Shanghai. This, that's the image that springs to mind for me. Um, there are many, it's not just in that country, there are many. But um, these masks are worn by people because over 250 days of the year, the quality of the air is considered damaging to health. So these effects of our emissions are really visible, they're really real, okay? I'm going to show you a very short clip now from a, uh, an organization called The Lancet, which um, outlines some of the difficulties um, with global health risks. Fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas 
has a profound impact on human health. As well as exacerbating climate change, fossil fuels are already causing heart and lung disease directly through poor air quality. The long-term effects from fossil fuels on global climate change will have even greater and more far-reaching effects on human health. But the news isn't all bad. This diagram lays out many of the key responses to climate change, all of which have significant co-benefits for human health. Low carbon vehicles and active transport like walking and cycling decrease air pollution and carbon emissions, and also decrease obesity and cardiovascular disease. In fact, through these co-benefits, and by preventing the potential loss to economic development, responding to climate change could be the biggest global health opportunity of this century. Most people view climate change as a threat, but there's significant variation. Over 70% of the population in Brazil, South Korea and Greece understand that climate change is a major threat compared to 40% or less in the USA and China. Trends of parts per million CO2 emissions are difficult to appreciate, but increasing asthma rates or exacerbating childhood undernutrition are tangible health problems that people relate to. Whether we respond to climate change, turning the threat it poses into an opportunity to improve public health, is no longer a question of scientific evidence or technological capability. It is now entirely a matter of political commitment. The health profession has a vital role to play in driving this transition, communicating the risks and ensuring climate change policies promote public health. We need to be at the forefront of this issue, helping to create a healthy future. in this little clip, but the key thing is that we have the ability to change some of these outcomes by doing uh, things that will help what they, they call co-efficiencies, these ideas of doing things that have dual benefits. So if you ride a bicycle, you're keeping the air cleaner, but you're also becoming healthier, exactly, and less likely to have diabetes and other kinds of health issues. Um, so I'm going to tell you very briefly a little bit about gathering the science. So how have we found out about all of these um, things? Where does the data and information come? But probably started in, the 50, in 1957 with the Russian uh, Sputnik going into space and taking photographs of our Earth, which gave us this, this picture of a globe. And the improvements with computers and IT and data um, in the 60s began to give us an opportunity to gather information about climate change. This led to something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change being set up by different countries. So this organisation is a group of scientists uh, and, uh, and people who are working from all different countries around the globe. I think it's 180 or 190 different countries that are involved in this. And they produce reports. So they've done these four, five reports. And each report becomes slowly more and more certain that the causes of global warming, warming are anthropogenic. In other words, that we are, um, we are producing them. Um, their first report was worrying enough for them to set up a framework convention. This just means a sort of a plan of how we're going to deal with it, of what we need to do. Um, the treaty objective was to stabilize GHG, greenhouse gas, concentrations in the atmosphere. And the idea of doing this was to prevent our interference with the climate system and allow an ecosystems to adapt, to ensure that food production isn't threatened, and to enable economic development in a sustainable way. So this treaty set out quite a long time ago, I've highlighted the date, in 1992, that this is what we needed to do. But the process um, was very slow and difficult. 
if you imagine trying to get lots of different countries together and agreeing, you have a scenario in which some countries have very low emissions, but yet were asked to contribute um, to the process. You have other countries pr producing lots and lots of emissions. So America, for example, is the highest producer of emissions. And America was not keen on signed, signing this Kyoto Protocol when it first came out because they were worried it would damage business. So there have been a lot of problems, but the statements get stronger. The information and the facts from the IPCC get stronger as it goes along. Until, if we look at 2014, so just uh, uh, very recently, the fifth report states very, very clearly there's a 97% agreement from scientists, these 880 or 90 scientists, that it's human causes that are causing our globe to warm, but also we need to act now to avoid these serious impacts. So where are we now? Well, I'd like to have a positive picture to show you. This is a graph that shows you the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air. Don't worry, I'm not very scientific. I find um, that some of the explanations for climate change are very confusing. There's lots of data, and the scientists themselves find it difficult to get one clear picture. But this way of measuring is, is quite clear. So these refer, refer to the parts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so they can measure how much or how little. And this is where we started in the 1960s, with sort of around 160 parts per million. And here we are now, today, I think this has just tipped a little bit further, we've gone over the 400 parts per million. Well, that doesn't mean much if I don't give you uh, some sort of scale of reference. And the scale of reference is that 350 degrees was considered to be the safe limit before which we start seeing quite dangerous and wide-reading reaching effects of climate change. So that is where we are at the moment. <coughs> also, this, this week in the news, NASA um, reported that uh, February, this February, is the largest ever temperature rise for a single month. So this startlingly high jump um, happened this month and came out in the news. I've been updating my slides literally on a weekly basis as lots of this information is coming out. Here is um, a statement from Bob Ward of the Grantham Institute. This is um, an institute of uh, where a, a, a body that at the LSC, the London School of Economics, that tries to link uh, research and policy. So they try, uh, it's, it's scientists trying to inform governments and policy makers. And this comment also came out um, uh, a few days ago. If we delay any, any longer strong cuts in global house gas emissions, global temperature is likely to succeed the level beyond which the impacts of climate change are likely to be very dangerous. So there's some really serious and stark warnings here. I don't want to frighten everyone, and my purpose today is to tell you that there's a lot that we can do. There's um, one campaign run by the Guardian newspaper that's been going for uh, a little while now, and it's called Keep It in the Ground. And the idea is, um, these, these figures are probably the most important figures for you to remember today. If I want you to go away remembering anything, it could be this particular um, set of information. So fossil fuel reserves means the amount of fossil fuel still in the ground. So the shale, oil, the, the gas, all in the ground that we haven't yet brought up. 80% of these fossil fuel reserves cannot be burnt. We cannot burn them. If we do burn them, then we're going to go across, above the agreed two degree limit that the Inter, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has set as a safe level. So there's numbers here that need some explanation. This is how much carbon we can burn. This is 565 gigatons. <coughs> Big numbers, they don't mean much, but you can see the difference between 565 gigatons 
and 2,795 gigatons. This is what we've got. This is what we can burn before we go over the scientifically agreed level of safety for, um, for the future. Despite this, there are companies that are still going further to find more oil, to find more resources. So there's a huge scramble in the Arctic with different countries trying to secure rights and licenses for more drilling in the Arctic. Another very <laughs> shocking statistic is the subsidies, the government subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. So this is money that governments give, directly or indirectly, to fossil fuel companies um, to encourage their growth and development. And uh, this year, 2015, again a very recent statistic, $5.3 trillion annually are given to the fossil fuel industry. We might not know really what, what does that mean, a million, a billion, a trillion. They're difficult numbers to really understand, aren't they? But this much is clear, $10 million a minute is quite a lot of money. And it amounts to 6.5% of the GDP spent. It also is greater, it's more money that's given, than is given to the total health spending by all the governments in the world. So I thought that was a very clear way of illustrating quite how much our fossil fuel industries are being subsidised, bankrolled by um, different countries. I think of the 28 top oil country, uh, companies in the world, 16 of them are either owned partially or wholly by governments. So you can see there's a conflict of interests there in which governments want development and growth, and development and growth means burning more fossil fuels, so they're subsidising these industries. This man is um, uh, a, an environmentalist, an activist, who set up a site called 350.org. Remember the 350 parts per million that's safe? Um, and he's got these rather two helpful little phrases, oil in the soil, and coal in the hole. In other words, we need to keep these fossil fuels in the ground. If we want a safe um, and a sustainable future, we need to keep them in the ground. I'm going to talk briefly now about uh, another um, environmentalist, a woman called Naomi Klein from Canada. And she's written a number of books, but her latest book is called This Changes Everything. And she's looking at the information on climate and saying, okay, this is so clear now, we need to change something. She's got quite a radical view. She looks at climate change from the point of view of economic systems. And her suggestion is that capitalism is not working. There are too many people at the top of the pile, too many people... Um, too much inequality in the system and that power is distributed in a very uneven and unfair way. And her claim in the book um, is that if we change the way that we look after our planet and the way we live, we can also change the way that uh, our financial systems run. So she's saying that being more environmental and caring about the planet is actually fundamental to um, a sustainable future. She points out that 50% of the planet live on less than $3.50 a day. Um, and she gives three examples in her film. It's quite a hard-hitting film. You need to take a handkerchief with you. It's also quite a sad film. It talks about how individuals, small, poor communities around the globe are directly affected by climate change and the actions of large oil companies. So the pictures I showed you of Alberta tar sands before, um, there's an indigenous group that lives on those lands, and those lands belong to them. But um, these large oil companies have managed to secure the rights to drill and put a fence around the land, and the indigenous people are not allowed in any longer. 
and they're very worried about the state of uh, their land and the pollution on it. She also looks at a Greek community, a poor Greek community with uh, a beautiful, uh, beautiful environment, lovely green trees, very lush um, place. And again, there's a drilling or mining project that's being suggested. And it's about this small Greek community taking to the streets and campaigning against the mining project. And the third uh, example I'm going to give you from there is um, about wetlands in India. So um, again, this is some of the very poorest people um, who have wetlands where they can grow their food and they can drink the water. And there's a proposed coal fire plant um, that uh, this company is uh, attempting to set up. And it's about how they are campaigning for this not to happen. Okay. So I'm going to move on now to the slightly more positive bits of the lecture. If you're feeling a little depressed by all of this information, I apologise, and I hope that I'm now going to mitigate that a little bit. Why aren't we taking action? Why isn't everybody running around saying, come on, we must do something? Well, I think there are a lot of confusing things um, to do with climate change. And the first one is that... Um, Again, another environmentalist notes that for more than two decades, the fossil fuel industry has been funding scientists, think tanks, and others to deny and cast doubt on the scientific understanding of global warming. So there's real reasons why people have wanted us not to believe that climate change is happening. So the first one we looked at was growth worried about it affecting growth. This is a, a, an organization in America that is um, comprised of many people from the oil and, and um, gas companies. And they found, founded an organization called the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change, which, if you were listening earlier, is very, very similar to the government um, groups around the world who did set up their IPCC. These ones have set it up and said they're trying to show that climate change is not real, it's not here. There's, in fact, they actually say it's a non-existent crisis. Um, and this Vice President, James Taylor, even goes on to say, global house gas emissions are having a modest and beneficial impact on global climate. This was in 2015, last year. So there really are um, groups of society or places uh, people, rather, who definitely do not want climate change to be um, clear and clearly spoken about. Even the well-intentioned, I've given the example of Obama, um, you'll, there, there's a, a, a clip of Obama very proudly standing in front of the camera saying, we're drilling everywhere, this is from last year. So still these attitudes towards fossil fuels and oils and what we can burn is still very, very much muddied and um, mystified. Just in the UK alone, for example, we were talking about subsidies um, previously. The UK fossil fuels earn 27 billion a year in subsidies, according to the IMF, but yet we're cutting uh, the subsidies from renewable energies just last year. So again, it seems that the science is saying one thing, but our actions seem to be going in a different direction. So this is where you come in, I hope. What could we do? Do we go back to nature? Do we get rid of technology? Do we stop driving cars? Do we stop going on holiday? I don't think that's really a very sustainable idea, is it? I don't think any of you here would want to embrace that. Um, technical solutions, I'll show you later some quite um, new innovative ideas, <coughs> but essentially there isn't going to be a technical fix, one technical fix that fixes climate change, or so scientists tell us, so climate scientists tell us. Personal change, I think personal change is probably where it starts, where we all begin to take um, a view on what climate change is and how we want our world to be. Political change, you need personal change first in order to encourage political change and social change as well. 
So let's have a look at some of the problems of social, political and personal change. This um, is a man, George Marshall, who works for something called Climate Outreach here in Oxford. And um, Climate Outreach tries to, tries to blend all of the information about all the, all the research on climate change and work out how to tell people, how to give them the message in the most positive and helpful way. Um, he's written a wonderful book, um, and in this book he talks about the values and the assumptions we have, who we are, why we find climate change difficult to understand, because it's a problem out there. He also talks about the fact that it's an abstract idea. Who's the baddie? Who's the enemy? You could say oil companies, but oil companies also provide jobs um, and uh, provide growth, which makes things better for society. So he looks at this idea of why it's so difficult. There's lots of reasons. Psychologically, it's a difficult notion to grapple with. Climate change predictions are really complex. I must have changed this talk a hundred times, looking up what information should I show them. Should I show them 350 parts per million? Should I show them which countries are the biggest uh, consumers? Should I? There's so much information, and it's all in uh, different, difficult formats. Some of it involves a lot of science. So it's complicated. Climate change is complicated. It's not a simple topic. This is really important, and it's what I really hope I'm not going to produce today, is defensive reactions, where you feel that somebody's attacking you, your way of life, who you are, your family, your country, how you live. We all have an identity, and it's built on what we do. So if somebody comes along and says, right, you need to do something completely different, then that can be difficult to take on board. Climate denial. This is what I was talking about previously, about some people definitely wanting to hide the evidence and uh, campaigning to show it isn't real for their own uh, benefits and gains. There's also a political element. So George Marshall's done a lot of research on how to speak to different groups of people. So if you're talking to a religious group of people, they may hold certain beliefs. So you need to speak to them in a certain way about climate change. They have a different view of the world and need to be respected and for that to be shown. You may be a, a, a conservative person, you may be a more radical person. Depending on where you are on the political spectrum will depend on how you hear the messages that are given to you. Last but not least is this idea of helplessness. Oh, what can I do? It's just me, I can't change this. Look at all these figures. Look at all these oil companies, what can I do? So this idea of, of, of being politically engaged, sometimes people aren't very engaged in politics. Sometimes people aren't able to make those connections very easily. But I really believe <laughs> that we need to look at this through an ethical lens, and I'm not alone. I think developing countries who've contributed the least to carbon emissions will be the ones most affected by this crisis. So the very poorest people in the very poorest places who've made the least carbon emissions are the ones that are going to be suffering from food shortages, droughts and other um, climate-induced um, effects. I mentioned these low-lying states before the islands in the Pacific that are likely to be um, uh, the, the shorelines creeping up. Poor agricultural communities where water and food shortages will be crippling. So if we get a slightly warmer summer um, or a much warmer summer, we're much more able to do something about that. Turn on the air conditioning, producing more carbon, or we might... Um, uh, we're able to dry fresh water and ice and things that we just take for granted. But in poorer agricultural communities around the world, that's not an option. So these will result, result in very severe, um, very, very severe effects. Bangladesh, for example, is the one country that kept on coming up through my research. 
The flooding there has been appalling and it's likely to get worse. And these, uh, these kinds of places and countries are very, very ill-equipped to be able to manage when these things happen. So that's why we, uh, I've entitled this um, section as an ethical lens. We need to really look at the ethics of climate change as well as the science. So finally I get to the reasons to be positive. Um, the reasons to be positive are very, very strong. I think the first thing is this turning tide where governments, countries um, and information is becoming much, much more towards the idea of building a sustainable future. I'm sure all of you had heard that phrase, a sustainable way of living or global warming or climate change, whereas a talk maybe 10 years ago, those ideas would have been much less clear to you. The COP21 uh, in Paris is just the, it's what they call the Conference of Parties, so the um, reports done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are made, and then there are meetings in which the countries try and organise how they're going to reduce carbon emissions. And the latest one in Paris was very positive. I imagine you've seen pictures of the Paris conference with all of the leaders holding hands and there was a great celebration. There were a few problems with um, the information, well, with the, with the um, deals that they were doing, but essentially it was positive. And lots of countries have signed up to reducing emissions and are taking it more seriously. So that's definitely a reason to be positive. At, these, um, at this conference, there was a general feeling that business and businesses had moved from this idea of, oh, global warming, climate change, what a pain, we've got, we've, it's going to be expensive and it's, it's, it's um, not what we want to do, to recognising that it's a real benefit. So many companies are now realising they have to have sustainable futures in order to make profits. So there's a shift of understanding, I believe, from one side to the other. We're all joining the dots. So we're beginning to see two degrees and below, that's okay. Two degrees and above, that's really not okay. So these messages, hopefully, are coming through to you. We've also got a massive surge in renewables um, and growing in potential and affordability. So renewable solar, hydro, wind power, these are becoming much, much, much cheaper um, and can offer huge benefits. So wider evidence and support is also another positive point. There are many more grassroots movements um, and this idea that we can mitigate can mitigate the effects of climate change by taking action quickly and decisively. We have the, the ability and we have the tools that we can do. So much of what comes out of all of these governmental reports, there are ways of making this better. There are ways of reducing our emissions, ways of changing our lifestyles that will lead to a more sustainable future. More solutions. So this one, uh, the first one I started with was the idea of removing the fossil fuel subsidy. So there's huge amounts of money, that $5.3 trillion <coughs> that goes into um, subsidising um, the fossil fuel industries. We could take that out of the fossil fuel industries and put that into renewables. And that would make them an even, it would bring down the price of them even more and allow for um, uh, a lot more um, development in that area. Research and development could be funded as well by this money. The other thing that we can do is to create low carbon energy <coughs> systems. Well, what does that mean? That means um, if we put into power solar power and wind power, if we look at these technologies, they're all possible job creations. We need people to implement them, we need people to build solar panels. We need people to install them. We need people to come and check them. So there's a whole raft of um, a society that could be created, jobs and infrastructures that could be created around these. So this new employment and new jobs 
it would also hopefully be therefore a fairer and more equitable society without these huge <coughs> changes. Cleaner, healthier living environments, <coughs> lower healthcare costs. We would be supporting <coughs> the poorer nations. We would be contributing more there, looking towards a more sustainable future and also improve disease control. So by using less fossil fuels and generating other forms of other systems, we could hope to look at all of these benefits. Um, there was a wonderful uh, article in the National Geographic uh, in November, the beautiful pictures um, of all the possibilities of a new carbon carbon free future and one of them was smart cities and these smart cities had green roofs and they had something called photocatalytic concrete so concrete that actually absorbed the dirt and the fumes from uh, the air lighting that adapts so as you ride your bicycle along the lights turn on and turn off when you've passed um, so some really creative ideas in terms of urban management um, businesses, there's the possibility of turning old uh, power stations, for example, gas or coal power stations, into cleaner, different kinds of power stations using renewable um, strategies and energy. There's also the idea of green bonds. So banks can lend money um, on the basis of uh, using money to generate uh, green uh, initiatives, so in other words, when you, the money that you're given by the bank or that you borrow from the bank is made from green investments, not from oil investments. So this whole idea of divestment um, is um, an important one as well. The ones that you'd expect, solar, wind, hydro energy, and then this one here, which I'm not sure if you'll have heard of, is carbon capture. It's basically when you produce the carbon, instead of throwing it into the air, you capture it and uh, store it deep down underneath in the ground. Which sounds a little funny, doesn't it? You take the carbon out and burn it and then you end up putting it back down. But these are all ways of keeping the, um, uh, the atmosphere a little cleaner. These are some of the more wacky opportunities. So geoengineering and research and development has looked at some quite different um, and quite exciting things. Not all of them seem um, possible, but there's the idea of taking CO2 out of the air. And they can do that in another, um, a number of ways. Air harvesting is effectively a way of hoovering um, CO2 out of the atmosphere. You can also sprinkle dust iron dust onto the oceans and that will encourage uh, plankton, the small, to grow. Um, this one I found difficult to perceive. It's the idea of throwing, imagine I have lots of plates and you throw these plates into the air and the plates <coughs> reflect the sun's uh, rays, so reducing the warming. I think this would be quite expensive and you'd need a lot of little plates. But it's just part of these ideas of beginning to think creatively of what we can do um, to help mitigate climate change. Um, the last one was injecting clouds with water. Um, marine clouds cause cooling. So if you put more water into the clouds, then that helps to cool the atmosphere. Um, the National Geographic had these wonderful pictures of little ships going around spraying the air with water. Um, I'm not suggesting that these are all ways that we can use, but it gives you an idea of the fact that people are thinking creatively on how to do things about it. So what can you do? I've told you lots about fossil fuels, about parts per million in the atmosphere, about uh, the governments and what they may be doing. And you might be thinking, well, what's this got to do with me? I don't work for an oil company. I'm not a government. But in fact, I think the most important thing, looking at you all today, you are the next generation of people. You may have children who are going to be the next generation of people making decisions. You come from all different disciplines and backgrounds and cultures. And you're input into how people think about this is really important.
important. So you can learn about it, you can talk about it, and you can educate yourself and others. Lifestyle. I imagine many people thought today I was going to talk about how you can recycle and how you can use a bicycle to save energy and how you shouldn't fly on aeroplanes. But I'm sorry if I disappointed you, but I am going to send out a link afterwards so you can work out your carbon footprints, you can see where you can reduce your own personal emissions. But that's something that's very well catered for on this World Wildlife um, uh, Fund uh, website, that link that I'll send you. So you can do that <coughs> on your own. Community. Now, as international students here, I don't know if, how involved you are in your local communities, but all over Oxford are low carbon groups, and they meet and they give you tips on how to reduce your emissions, and they also um, encourage campaigning for different things and to get your voice heard. So this community may refer to here, if you don't quite feel strong enough, there will be these action groups and communities in your own countries. You'll need to go and look for them and find out about them. They're not going to come and present themselves to you necessarily. So the community ones here, I'm not sure how many people know of the bike doctor on campus. Does anyone know about the bike doctor? No? no? Well, there's a man who is round at the sports centre every Tuesday who's called the bike doctor. And he will fix your bike for free if you go and leave it there with him. If you need parts, then you'll have to pay for those. But it's an example of how Brooks is attempting to encourage everybody to get on bicycles and um, use uh, this lower uh, carbon form of transport. So you could, you could, if you're happy riding bikes, you can go and um, have your bike fixed by the bike doctor. Oxgrove is another organisation in Oxford that works at a drop-in allotment. So if you want to go and grow a little bit and talk to other people and find out about low carbon initiatives, that's Oxgrove. The Tull Street Cafe in town has, is, has the student hub above, which can connect you to volunteering groups. Um, I'm running really briefly through these. You'll, have, you'll be able to research these later um, in more depth if you're interested in doing these things. But, um, these CAGs, or um, community action groups, are ways in which you can learn a little bit about what's going on in the community, how you can help, and how you can um, spread the word. The last point I put on here is political. This may not be for everybody, but if you are um, keen, you can lobby politicians. You can send letters to your prime minister, to your local MPs. You can look at these websites as well for further information and advice on how to reduce your emission, your carbon footprint. So the last thing I'm going to leave you with today is this idea that <coughs> climate change is a problem of personal consumption. So each of us makes a difference. Okay, it's what we consume. Here's a few examples. This was the IPCC's suggestion of our, if we were to use 2,000 watts of power a year, then that would keep the emissions within a sustainable level. Well, the average American uses 12,000, compared to somebody in Bangladesh, where there are very few resources, who only uses 300. But you can see how when you multiply that up over the number of people on the planet, it really does make a difference. And I think by 2025, we're going to have another billion people on the planet, so it's going to become even more um, important. Naomi Klein talks about this idea of conscientious <coughs> reduction, so thinking about how you can reduce that impact um, in your own personal way. So talk about it. I talked at the beginning about science and silence and solutions. So break the silence, talk um, to other people about it, inform yourself, be positive and constructive and purposeful. One of um, the Brooks, um, we, we, we're looking at active citizenship here, so there um, are five graduate attributes which we hope that when you leave the university you will have the 
these attributes to take forward with you into your working world. And one of them, I'm, I haven't got time to go through them all today, but one of them is active citizenship, which asks you to be informed about the issues of equity, that's fairness, sustainability and social justice. So if that isn't a call to engage in um, with, with, with climate change, then I don't know what is. I'd even suggest a sixth graduate attribute, which might be carbon literacy. Um, the other two things that you could do is you could lobby for a student-led environment group at Brooks. At the moment, we don't have a group of students who are telling people about climate change. There was a group, and they graduated. There isn't a group following them afterwards. So Sebastian Blake, the sustainability team here, has said he'd be very happy to help guide that. But it shocked me that we didn't have that. Okay? So if you want to become part of a group here, come and speak to me, go and speak to Sebastian Blake um, or Lisa, and we can help you um, start to do that. <coughs> and the last thing is the chance to win a prize. So we've got an active citizenship prize um, in OBI. So if you wanted to um, uh, submit an essay on climate change or some ideas or, or uh, thoughts on climate change, maybe what it is for you or in your country, then you could submit that for the active citizenship prize um, that we're holding. Again, you'd need to speak to Lisa about the details for that. So the last thing I'm going to... Um, do today is just to sum up. There's three things I hope you go away with. Number one is that human influence is clear and it's growing. Secondly, we need to act quickly to avoid increasingly destructive outcomes. And lastly, but most importantly, we do have the means to limit climate change and build a better future. Okay. So this choice is, um, I'm going to finish with this quote from the World Health Organization um, because I think it's very positive and sums up the ideas I'm hoping to have um, expressed to you. As a global society, we have a choice. The actions taken by countries and their citizens add up. If we take strong actions to address climate change while choosing paths that protect and promote health, we have the opportunity to collectively bring about a planet that is not only more environmentally intact, but also has cleaner air, more abundant and safer fresh water and food, more effective and fairer health and social protection systems, and as a consequence, healthier people. Okay. So, um, that's my reference list. Um, thank you very much for listening. And if anybody's got any questions, I'd be really happy to answer them. Okay, well, first of all, I think we ought to give Kathy a Just remember that Kathy's not a, an expert or a specialist in this, so this is so, something that Kathy's very interested in. So all of this information has come from just Kathy's own personal knowledge and interest in this. So I think that um, there's a lot for us to think about there. Okay. So has anybody got any questions? Did you have a question at the back? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for such a lovely presentation. Thank you. you a lot of information from. Thank you so much for your efforts. Um, just a question about, two questions actually, about uh, if we keep like not investing that money in climate change, but investing it in, uh, for instance, um, taking the carbon from, from like factories, business factories, and instead of putting it in the ground, taking a spaceship to the black hole. Because I think if you put it in the ground, you're just like you're damaging the soil, so they might like contribute that way. That's a really, well, it's a good question. Let me answer that one first, then you can ask me the other one. I think the point of carbon <coughs> capture feels wrong, doesn't it, to stick it in the ground beneath us. But uh, I'd have to say that um, the, the idea of sending it up into space is, is a question, it, it's a very logical question. Why don't we send it off somewhere else? But if you think of the um, billions of pounds that have been spent on, on space technology just to get 
you know, a small number of people into space and back again. It gives you some of the, uh, a, an idea of some of the costs involved in doing that. So, um, I, 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 my, my response to that is I think the costs involved would be prohibitive. Um, you, you, it would yeah. really cost a huge amount of money. Yeah. Um, but I, I do hear you, and I think this notion of capturing it and sticking it in the ground doesn't feel very good. That's what we do with nuclear energy as well. We seal it in containers and we, and we bury it. So ideally what we do is not put so much of it in the air in the first place, and then we don't have to bury so much. But it's a huge area of research and development, so there's a lot of work being done on how, to, um, how best to capture carbon. One of the other ways of capturing carbon is, of course, you can see outside here are trees. So um, deforestation, well, we, when we cut down trees, we, we limit the Earth's ability to store um, that carbon from the air. And so one way of helping is to plant lots of trees, to plant more plants and animals and protect the areas that we have. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Um Sorry, if I may ask the second one, it leads to the first one. Uh, and you said you, you mentioned uh, uh, planting trees. Uh, as you know, uh, more than 70% of the Earth's coast is oceans and water. I do. So um, if we like, uh, as the Emirates do done, like by uh, uh, making a human island uh, just in front of the Bush Cleaver, is uh, like. Island, they like making the shape of trees. <coughs> in Emirates, they have a, well, they just put like a soil, for yeah. them, then they create a new island. Yeah. So, and if we do the same in the ocean, uh, this, this is the ocean, yeah, which is like the largest ocean in there, and like huge amount of uh, space out there. So, if you plant like human islands there, and you plant more and more trees, Yes, I think replanting, reforestation is, a, is a, um, again a, another area that people are looking into. Primarily we're cutting down trees a lot faster than we're planting them, so that's a problem. But this idea of creating islands, the first thing that springs to mind, again this isn't my discipline, but the first thing that springs to mind is that creating islands you need concrete. And to create concrete, for each tonne of concrete that you create, you create a tonne of carbon as well. So there's a problem there with just sort of, you know, creating false land masses. Really it's about, which is why I think I was speaking about this idea of there aren't any magic technological solutions. It really is about us looking at the resources that we have and working out how best to protect them for the damage we've done already and how we can improve upon um, the Earth's own systems for re replenishing itself um, uh, to try and limit these, these effects. Yeah, okay, yeah, awesome. thanks for your questions. Does anyone else have a question? Judy, go for it. Yeah, um, we've got a lot of students from countries that have oil-based economies. Mm. Um, like, well, basically the Middle East is, you know, the economies are based on the export of fossil fuels like oil. How do you think it is actually possible for the shift in those economies to take place? And do you think there will be some development in terms of, I don't know if you can make a carbon-free oil, can you, or something yeah, like you that? Can't, or, you or can't. Or and I, I hear, I, I think it, it's a very good point and probably the, it's probably the biggest question in everybody's minds. Well, great, we've got to stop burning um, car fossil fuels. Well, what are we going to do with all of those people, all of the industry, everything that's built up around it? I think that's a very valid point. I think I'd have to answer it by saying we can't get away from the science. We're not able to burn that carbon. So we're going to have to change our ways of making money and change our infrastructures. It will call, I think, for a really radical reshift in thinking um, in terms of how we produce, how our, how we produce money and how people are employed. But there is huge evidence to support the fact. I think if you think about how we created our economy out of fossil fuels and, and, and industry, 
there is just as much industry. The world is growing exponentially. There's, again, there's another billion people by 2025. All those people need feeding. So if we employ renewable energies and sustainable techniques, then there are, there are ways of people to make money. Yeah. And the, the costs um, that are saved through not through the sort of global health and the crisis. I didn't stop very long on the costs of the, um, the extreme weather um, crises. But those costs are, are going to directly take money out of the hands um, of people who, who, who need it most. So if we create economies that run on sustainable technology, sustainable, <coughs> sustainable employment, then we reduce those. So um, I'm not an economist. I, I'm not sure that I can entirely answer that question yeah. other than say, um, you know, we cannot burn that carbon 80% of it. You know, it, 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 otherwise we're sitting in a situation where we're saying, well, we've got to keep burning it because that's my job. We've got to keep burning it because that's our economy. And then we're into situations that projected forecasts by the end of this century are really truly terrifying. They could be anything up to 6.5 degrees. Some, um, some people even said 8 degrees. And that's when you know, life on the planet starts becoming it's unimaginable. So there is this sort of, we need to do something about it. So maybe going for solar power, obviously there's a lot of sun. Solar and hydro. There are lots and lots of um, ways of, of, of finding the energy sources we need. Germany is a really good example that switched in the last literally sort of eight or nine years to almost 70% renewables in their country. And these wonderful pictures of old um, nuclear plants that have been painted and turned into playgrounds, and there's a whole you know, economy grown up around them. So I can't categorically say, oh, it'll be fine if we get rid of fossil fuel um, jobs and employment, but I think there's a good argument to, to suggest that we can create a different kind of economy. Naomi Klein's book would be a good place to start. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Thank you very much for listening.